you, Dr. Schramm, for that introduction. Uh, you missed one thing, and it's probably the most intimate sense, to marry a former Ashbrook scholar. All right. Uh, her picture's up on the wall there somewhere. I'm not sure which one was yours. But, uh, at any rate, I enjoyed my time here. It was a great place to be. I enjoyed the students, and I'm now colleagues with uh, former Ashbrook scholars back at Hillsdale. Um, uh, i got to tell one anecdote about Dr. Schramm. Why don't I do that? Um, he came to my wedding. Uh, I'm not sure that he got there on time, but he was there for the reception at the very least. Uh, and uh, as I was going around shaking hands and pressing flesh and being congratulated and all the rest of it, most people saying, what a, what a great thing you've done and what a remarkable woman you've married. Dr. Schramm looked at me in this, uh, this uh, semi-salacious, semi-wise way that only he has, looked straight at me and said, you know you're making a mistake, right? <laughs> And then he looked at my bride and said, and then looked back to me and said, but oh, what a mistake. <laughs> I've had occasion to use that line over the years when my wife and I were discussing things. Um, so it's come in handy. Uh, at any rate, thank you for having me here. I, I really do like coming back to the Ashbrook Center. I tried to stay in contact as much as I could with things that go on. Um, and I want to set things off um, in good Ashbrook fashion by uh, referring back to the past and specifically a political leader who thought about uh, the world and, and even education. Uh, in in uh, his debates with Stephen Douglas for the Senate in 1858, um, Lincoln said the following words, which I think may be helpful to us today. Uh, he's refuting a number of the things that Lincoln is, uh, Douglas is saying, and, and I'm going to read a fairly long quote, but uh, it's going to be worthwhile. This being true, and this being the way, I think, that slavery is to be made national, let us consider what Judge Douglas is doing every day to that end. In the first place, let us see what influence he is exerting on public sentiment. In this, in community, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Consequently, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. He makes statutes and decisions possible or impossible to be executed. Later on in the debate, he comes back to this theme. Henry Clay, my beau ideal of a statesman, the man for whom I fought all my humble life. Henry Clay once said of a class of men who would repress all tendency to liberty and ultimate emancipation that they must, if they would do this, go back to the era of our independence and muzzle the cannon which thunders its annual joyous return. They must blow out the moral lights around us. They must penetrate the human soul and eradicate the love of liberty, and then, and not till then, could they perpetuate slavery in this country. Judge Douglas is going back to the era of our revolution and to the extent of his ability muzzling the cannon which thunders its annual joyous return. When he invites any people willing to have slavery to establish it, he is blowing out the moral lights around us. I begin with Lincoln on the important topic of slavery because I believe there's an analogy with what is going on today in this country. And it is, in fact, being illustrated in the current election cycle, as it is every four years or every two years. One party is clearly at odds with the principles of man and civil society that were clearly laid out by the founding fathers of this nation. The other party muddles its way through trying to advocate those principles with more or less conviction, depending on the candidate and the extent to which people are paying attention to the election. Why? Why should it ever be close? For 150 years of this nation's history, with the exception of the slavery crisis, which pit one half of the nation's material interests against the principles of the founding, both political parties agreed with and tried to remain faithful to the Constitution and the moral constitution of man on which the country is based. The parties argued over whether to have a bank and roads and how big the military should be and how high or low the tariff should be. But they did not argue over the nature of human beings. And neither party cringed on the 4th of July. All that changed in the year 1912, 100 years ago today, when no candidate of the three parties ran on the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution. In fact, they ran overtly against them. <coughs> and ever since that year, now for a century, the nation has been divided over its own principles. How is it possible if, as the founders and Lincoln held, that the principles of freedom and self-government are written into the hearts and minds of men, that every two or four years the nation could gather on election day in order to decide the extent, but only the extent, to which its leaders will betray the Founders' vision of a free, ordered, ordered constitutional republic under the rule of law. My answer is that such a thing is possible if, and only if, 
the other 364 days out of the year. Someone or some collection of someones is blowing out the moral and the intellectual lights around us. Now, there are a lot of folks doing this very thing. Lobbyists, think tanks, most of Hollywood, and the media. But my candidate for the most successful and systematic agent of what goes by the name of hope of change, but really is the moral and intellectual diminution of man, is the public schools. In fact, I think they're even more successful in doing this than the colleges are. So the, the story, the college story is important too. And I'm not alone in the sense. Now, if I wanted to spend all my time today on the deliberate hijacking of the nation pub nation's public schools by the progressives, we would have to look at what was going on in the early 20th century, right as the election of 1912 was taking place. And the key figure that we'd have to look at would be John Dewey. Have you all ever heard about Dewey, read Dewey, studied Dewey? If you're interested in that story, you should read Dewey to begin with a pamphlet that he wrote called My Pedagogy Creed which is an outline, an outline encapsulated form of everything he was trying to accomplish in the schools. But since we don't have time for that exhaustive treatment of Dewey today, I wanted you at the very least to look at the results of Dewey's and the progressive success, as seen through the words of, I think, the greatest anti-progressive novel in the country ever, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> How many of you have read To Kill a Mockingbird? Good. One of these things is assigned at almost every high school. Let's see if you remember these words. In fact, I gave this to you in your, in your handouts. The remainder of my school days were no more auspicious than the first. Indeed, they were an endless project, capital P, that slowly evolved into a unit, capital U, in which miles of construction paper and wax crayon were expended by the state of Alabama, Alabama in its well-meaning but fruitless efforts to teach me brute dynamics. <laughs> What Jim, Jim of course is Scout's brother, called the Dewey Decimal System. The Dewey Decimal System was school-wide by the end of my first year, so I had no chance to compare it with other teaching techniques. I could only look around me, Atticus and my uncle, who went to school at home, who went to school at home, knew everything. At least what one didn't know, the other did. Furthermore, I couldn't help noticing that my father had served for years in the state legislature, elected each time without opposition, innocent of the adjustments my teachers thought essential to the development of good citizenship. Jim, educated on the half decimal, half dunce cap basis, seemed to function effectively alone or in a group. But Jim was a poor example. No tutorial system devised by man could have stopped him from getting at books. As for me, I knew nothing except what I gathered from Time Magazine and reading everything I could lay my hands on at home, but as I inched sluggishly along the treadmill of the Macon, Macon County school system, I could not help receiving the impression that I was being cheated out of something. Out of what I knew not, yet I did not believe that 12 years of unrelieved boredom was exactly what the state had in mind for me. <laughs> now, you've all read To Kill a Mockingbird in a school context. What did you say in your classes? when you got to that passage of To Kill a Mockingbird? Amen. You said amen? And was your teacher in the room? Yes. And what did she say? Poor attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Who had the poor attitude? I did. You did? <laughs> what about the rest of it? Was anything said about this passage, or do you even remember it? See, this is my great question to people who supposedly have read To Kill a Mockingbird in a school setting. If you read the book, and you understood it, you have there the most succinct and powerful indictment against the public school system as it now exists. And you would have had to have talked about it. But if you would have read it and understood what was going on, the school system would actually be good. You see what I mean? It's a catch-22. This would be a banned book if people actually knew what it said. And the fact that they don't know what it says shows us that we're not teaching literature. <laughs> At any rate, um, please go back and read chapter two, and you will see exactly there's a very good indictment of what goes on in the class. It's a masterful treatment of it. And in fact, read the whole thing. Notice that Walter Cunningham, by the way, uh, is resisting very effectively the welfare state, as is his father. Notice also, if you would, that Atticus Finch, I'm pretty sure, <coughs> is a Lincoln character. And then I think you'll start having a pretty good discussion about the kill of at any rate, what are the things that Scout was being che cheated out, out of? 
that every child going through a public school today is being cheated, cheated out of. Well, the first thing is language. If the school should teach anything, it is the command of the English language. It's correct spelling, grammar, and usage. For centuries, schools did this, and interestingly enough, they learned to lean heavily on Latin for the grammatical components. I hear now that you all have Latin at Ashland. This is a good thing. Um, uh, at any rate, for example, until about 1940 or so, depending on where you live, you would have experienced in the primary grades the teaching of orthography. Have you ever come across the word orthography? Orthography means, literally, the science of correct spelling. Which is to say that there is a correct spelling in the English language, and there are rules to it. Um, English is a phonetic language. There are 45 phonemes that represent different sounds in the English language. They're put together, and they have rules. And you have to learn those rules in order to know how to spell. That all got junk with progressive education. And the, the claim is that English is not phonetic. Let me give you an example. Um, how, many, how many sounds does the letter A make? Somebody shout it out if you think you know. Very tentative response here. Maybe they don't know. Here is the response that I got one time when I had a master's degree in literacy with five years teaching experience call me on the phone and wanting a job. She said she would be a great asset to the school. I had not looked at her resume because I saw where she had come from and I was not interested. So she was pushing and I said, okay, very well. You're, you have a master's degree in literacy and five years teaching experience. Can you tell me how many sounds the letter A makes. Silence. Then a tentative uh, two sounds, long A and short A. To which I said, oops, the letter A actually makes four sounds, maybe five if you want to debate it. And every one of my kindergartners can tell kindergartners can tell me that. The sounds are a, 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 a. And uh, I don't think you would be of very much use at this school. Which she responded, but I'm a good teacher. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure you are. Thank you for your call. Um, how could you teach spelling at all and not know that you don't call your father your father or your father? That makes no sense. Um, so these people are, have master's degrees in literacy, and they don't understand the English language. Now, if you get into grammar, which was, which was junk years ago, who actually teaches grammar anymore? Very few people. For example, I've had people wanting to go teaching, teaching English, teaching grammar, uh, teaching elementary school, and I usually ask the question, well, what is the participle? Big eyes, I get. They don't know. What is a gerund? They don't know. If you don't know, look it up. You know, sir. <clears throat> Very well. So running is a great exercise. Um, the participle is close. It's an adjective. Weaver, running to the store, I broke my leg. Running modifies I. I think I'm right about that. Grammarians don't know that. And why? Because the public school system is, alas, I hate to tell you this, blowing out the linguistic lights around us. So how about mathematics? This is supposedly a high-level thinking skill necessary to be competitive in a global market. As we were told by politicians and pundits today, ad nauseum. Are Americans any good at math? Uh, there was a same semi-famous Japanese fellow who was a mathematician who came over to America, and he went back to Japan, and some reporter asked him, well, what's the difference between Americans and Japanese? There must be differences between the two cultures. The mathematician, looking at the world mathematically, said, yes, there is one big difference. Americans can't make change. <laughs> now, this is more than anecdotal, because the other day I was actually in the coll a college mailroom. I will not tell you which college. And I needed a stamp to put on a letter so that I could send it. And I said, could I have a stamp, please? He should, said, sure. I handed him a dollar. There's no cash register. There's no computer down there. And therefore, what he is having to do is think through what, what are stamps, 43, 44 cents? So he's trying to figure out how much change he's supposed to give me. He's fumbling around and wondering what's taking so long. And finally, I said, I don't mean to ask you this, but are you having trouble making change? Uh, uh, yeah. And so I said, I told him how much change he needed to give me back. He gave it to me. I got my stamp, sent it off. This, I didn't tell you, this is the important part. He's actually a student. As you know, students work on campus all over the place. So as I'm walking out, 
couldn't resist, and I turned back around and I said, I hope you're not a math major. <laughs> to which he responded, no, sir, finance. <laughs> <laughs> How scared should we be? And the reason it, the reason this is the case is because, as you probably know, may know for your own schooling, you were probably given a calculator at a very early age, and you were never required to learn the very basics of mathematics. Let's not even get into dividing fractions and why you do that. Addition and subtraction and multiplication are hard enough to teach you things. Why? I would submit because the public schools are blowing out the mathematical and scientific lights around us. History and politics, I won't say too much about because you're more familiar with these subjects. Just realize that until the progressive hijacking of schools, students knew history and geography cold. For example, a common question on a college ex entrance exam at the end of the 19th century was, quote, name all the presidents between Fillmore and Hayes and say something about their administrations. No multiple choice, no multiple guess, nothing like that. Tell us about all the presidents. That was the question. And it could have been any presidents up to that time. Now, why is this important? So what if we forget that William Henry Harrison fell ill on his inauguration and died only a month later, or that Benjamin Harrison, Tippett News grandson from North Bend, Ohio, signed the first peacetime federal budget to reach the $1 billion mark? Had to be in Ohio, didn't it? <laughs> How important is it that we have uh, uh, when we have crises enough in our own time. Why do we care about who these presidents are? Well, what we're told these days by the professional educators is that anything that smacks of rote learning is hazardous for the child's mind and spirit, that it is much better for them to engage in projects that will show them not what to learn, but how to learn. And in the age of the internet, they can always look things up. See, the problem with this idea is that young people do not learn anything. They learn nothing, absolutely nothing, about language or math or science or politics. Consequently, their minds are susceptible to junk language, or junk science, or junk politics. If you do not know that the two largest periods of growth in the American economy during the 20th century occurred under the presidencies of, can you name the two? Presidencies where you had the largest time frame of economic growth. Nope. Reagan and Coop. Silent count. If you know that, and that such economic growth was spurred by the cutting of confiscatory tax rates on higher incomes, then will you be susceptible to the suggestion that will be made 10,000 times in the present campaign that the way to jumpstart the economy and to level the playing field is to make, take the top 1% or 5% or 10% or whatever the number is to take their fair share of taxes? In fact, if I did not know that you teetotaling Ashbrook scholars and simply ordinary college students, I would inform you of the drinking game of taking a belt every time you hear the phrase, their fair share in this election cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and you would be a drunk pretty soon. <laughs> if, you know nothing, if you know nothing about anything, that makes you, as a citizen, what Thomas Jefferson called a fit subject for despotism. Which is why Jefferson spent so much time thinking about education and all the founders thought that for the Republican experiment to persist, Americans would need, need a solid liberal education. Further, that education should consist primarily in language and history and government, or another way of putting that, in words and deeds and first principles. But our public schools are blowing out the historical <coughs> and philosophical lights around us. Now, I promised with Lincoln to talk about the moral lights around us. If education in this country is as bad as I say, I should say public education, then the public schools would in fact be innervating our moral sense, compromising traditional virtues, or blowing out, quote, that little light of celestial fire called conscience, end quote, in the words of a manners book that Washington copied down at age 12. Are the schools doing this? Let's go back to Harper Lee's satire. We know that elementary students do arguably stupid projects rather than learn important things. We know that these sorts of things continue well into the high school years. The literature teacher that I know, for example, when she read To Kill a Mockingbird, said that the only assignment that she had was to write down her feelings as she read the novel. And they never actually read the novel in class or discussed it. This is a smart young woman, yet she didn't read the book with understanding. But I ask you, if this is the case, then what is the ultimate take-home
take-home project that the schools require in high school? What is the ultimate take-home project the schools require in high school? Graduation portfolio. Sorry? Your graduation portfolio. Your graduation portfolio? Okay, maybe so. Let's think about this. Does that blow out the moral lights around you? What's the thing that needs to be experimented with? It needs to be tested. Something you can't do at school, so it has to be a take-home project. Sex ed. <laughs> the ultimate take-home project. Can't do it at school, at least not when anybody's looking. <laughs> the, pro the progressive idea is not to talk about the first principles behind the thing, but to engage in the thing pragmatically. The idea comes straight out of the philosophy of William James. The school of all institutions elevates doing above thinking. The school no longer holds to what are called traditional or family values, what used to be called simply virtues. Students get to make their own decisions. This is the mantra of the school. And yet, sex is in the schools. It's all over the schools. To remind students that it is an option <coughs> they need to be considering. If they were somehow unaware of their burgeoning libido and growing hormonal anarchy. Sex is presented as an option. No one is required to have it, but it is assumed that that is the default position. So the compassionate bureaucrat slash expert in the form of the teacher, often a gym teacher, is there to show kids how to do sex safely, whatever that means. All this happens in a health class. That's interesting, health. This seems coincidentally to be a territory marked out as well by the progressive politicians. And what happens if the birth control does not work or the students fail to use it properly? Well, the progressive state is there to help them in the form of WIC or ADC or a host of other alphabet agencies based upon sexual incontinence and what my colleague Paul Ray refers to simply as bastardy. Now, you may think we've gone a little far afield here, but I assure you, failing to know the educational bureaucracy, what they're really up to, means you will fall prey to it. For example, Hillsdale College right now, through a charter school initiative, helping start up a school in New Mexico. There are a few policies we're having to work around. Those policies that are passed by the state are revealing. The first is that the principal of the school, unless he has a PhD, must be certified. The second is that all the teachers must be certified. The third is that the one academic policy that <laughs> cannot be waived, that must stay in the curriculum, that cannot be altered in any way, is the one recently passed by the New Mexico legislature, and the policy is on sexual education. Why? Why this one? Why wouldn't the state of New Mexico care more about children reading than the illusion of their having safe sex? And what do you think that condoms and birth control have become, why do you think that they've become an issue in the presidential campaign? It would seem not to make sense until you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Thus, when we look around at the chronic problem of teenage and out of wedlock pregnancy, to say nothing of promiscuous sexuality that pervades the culture, we can say with no hesitation that the public schools are blowing out the moral lights around us. The question you may want to ask is how, in Lincoln-esque fashion, might we rekindle the moral and intellectual lights of this great nation? How might we even, perhaps, bring to the nation a new birth of freedom by restoring the education the founder, founding fathers considered an indispensable foundation of freedom? I actually have hope that it can be done. I'm something of an optimist, having spent so much time around Dr. Schramm. I've seen it done. He is, he's, one, he's known as a great optimist in this country. You have some expression about things, things are horribly bad but not yet hopeless, or something like that. I have seen this, the right sort of education put into place, and it can be done, but doing it takes a lot of work and means making a bunch of it. And I'll try to speak the rest of my time about this. Let me say first that I think the main effort needs to be the reform of public schools. I have nothing against private schools. In fact, I'm very much for them. The more I'm going to be talking about private schools, more particularly. The more private schools there are, the better, because the growth of private schools clearly reflects the dissatisfaction with the public schools. I'm also all for homeschooling. Um, my wife just taught my son how to read, and um, she did a great job of it. And I'm sure a fair number of you were homeschooled. Um, at any rate, it would not be hard to prove that one vital aspect of homeschooling is the restoration of the traditional home itself, as well as the educational component that goes with it. Nonetheless, since most children in this country go to public schools, since
since we all pay taxes to sustain those schools. And since the nation and the local community pay infinitely more attention to what happens in a public school than in a private or a home school, the fight must be for the public schools. And that means charter schools, because rule number one in school reform is that the neighborhood public school cannot be reformed from within any more than the British Empire could be reformed from within in 1776. The neighborhood school must be broken away from completely. Any promises from within a school or a school district are simply part of the public school's elaborate shell game to deceive us into thinking that there is real change just around the corner. So the first thing we need to do is start a good charter school in order to start a good charter school or good charter school laws. And that depends on the state that you're in. Ten states still do not have any charter schools. Most of the rest have pretty weak laws. That means that it is relatively hard to start a charter school, and it is also hard to get the kind of school you want because of regulations that have to be followed. Those regulations, of course, are put there precisely so the existing school districts do not have too much competition from new charter schools. The states that have the best charter school laws are, in order, Arizona, by far the best, followed by Colorado, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Georgia. Ohio is not among that number, nor is Michigan, though things may be improving slightly. So let's assume that we have good charter school laws and can do what we, whatever we want to. Let's then, as Plato says, build a school in our imagination. What would it look like? What would be the components that would make it good? Well, I'm a fairly simple fellow, and I think that all you really need are good teachers, a good curriculum, and good students. You need a couple of other things, and we'll talk about those. But those are the three main things to have a good education. I see some folks smiling, so this must have been said before. Dr. Foster has said this, I suppose. No, I'm laughing at the fact that you call those simple things. Uh, simple in the sense that it's not hard to arrive at the idea that these are the things that you need. You have to understand, though, Dr. Foster, that common sense in contemporary American public schools is totally out the door. So saying the most unoriginal common sense things in the world is actually to seem like a beacon of light. I'm sorry that's too late. The first is the curriculum, or what the progressive educators refer offhandedly to as content. The curriculum is really not the mystery people act like it is. The curriculum is simply a collection of good books read in the right order and in the right way. To be sure, there are skills that must be built before one can even read it all, but those skills are to be found in traditional phonics, as I suggested, in traditional grammar. There's no mystery, and all of contemporary brain research supports that. Once a child can read, he just needs to be invited to read good books and have discussions about those good books. What sort of good books? Well, how about fables and nursery rhymes and fairy tales to start off with? Then the children move on to more difficult works of imaginative literature, such as <coughs> Alice in Wonderland. Sorry, Alice in Wonderland. Or Robinson Crusoe, probably an adapted version for younger kids. Do you all still read Frederick Douglass in the program? Is this true? Um, when's the first time you encountered Frederick Douglass? Really read it all the way through. Here? In the school that I ran out in Colorado, every student read Frederick Douglass's narrative in fifth grade. Imagine having that experience and learning about what freedom is in the fifth grade. You could build a foundation. By the time, uh, oh, every sixth grader reads Julius Caesar in the school that I worked with. The whole play, not dumbed down. By the time you get to the high school, the students are reading the greatest works of the Western canon. Homer's Iliad, all of it, Virgil's Aeneid, which has virtually disappeared from high schools. Shakespeare, Jane Austen, all of Moby Dick, Conrad, Dostoevsky. Of course, the school should teach more than great books. It should not uh, teach exclusively uh, what Matthew Arnold called the best that has been thought and said, but it should also teach what has been sung and painted and done and discovered. That means the study of music and art and history and science. <coughs> But the principle should always be the same. The principle should always be the same. And it should be the principle that Churchill invoked when he was asked at the White House what scotch he would prefer. He said, I should be satisfied with the very best. <laughs> That's the kind of scotch to drink. We can talk more about the curriculum if you wish to, because it's an intriguing statement, and so maybe in the discussion we can do that. The second important element of a school is the faculty, the teachers. You will never have a good school without good teachers. Because those books, though you can decide upon them, are still very mysterious. And the harder the book, the more mysterious it is to read. That's why you can sit in a high school class and read To Kill a Mockingbird, and 
and not get two thirds of it, but just know you like it. So you need good teachers. This may seem like a no brainer. You must know, however, that getting good teachers is the biggest obstacle to creating the kind of school young people deserve. That is because of the abomination that is teacher <coughs> licensure or certification. And I choose that word deliberately. I don't want to say too much about this issue other than certification is one of the greatest hoaxes ever perpetuated on the American people. It prevents smart, educated, and talented people from entering the teaching profession simply because most smart, talented, and intellectually ambitious young people are not going to spend the best years of their lives for study, sitting through Mickey Mouse courses on how to make bulletin boards or how to dumb down every category of human knowledge or courses designed to, uh, to program supposed teachers into thinking that children and whole races of people cannot learn. At any rate, the problem is that in all but the states I've mentioned, even charter schools, which are meant to be the clear alternatives to the existing public schools, even charter schools are required to hire certified teachers, sometimes 100% certified teachers. Occasionally, 50% in the high schools, such as in North Carolina, or sometimes a whopping 10% of teachers you can hire that are uncertified in the great state of Indiana. What can happen, though, when state laws do not require the hiring of certified teachers? Let's say we could get rid of that rule. We could hire anybody we wanted to. What could we do? Well, you can fill up a high school faculty pretty easily with PhDs and folks with master's degrees from, from the very best programs in the country. You can hire intellectuals for teachers. <coughs> Imagine that. What is more impressive, perhaps, is that you can hire elementary teachers who are smart and have a solid and have solid academic backgrounds. For example, when I was running the school in Colorado, I hired a fourth grade teacher a fellow who had a degree in physics from the Naval Academy and a master's degree in theology. And he taught fourth grade. And he started teaching his students Greek in the fourth grade. I hired a fifth grade teacher who had a master's degree in St. John's, their great books program. I hired a first grade teacher who had two separate bachelor's degrees, one in art and one in chemistry. Try to find that combination. Two separate bachelor's degrees, one in art, one in chemistry. Not long after starting the school, I was able to convince the candidates who originally wanted to teach high school to teach elementary school when there were no high school jobs available. Now, why do that? Some people would say, why waste such a great mind on such young kids? Well, if you've read the classical orator and headmaster, Quintilian, spelled like Quintilian, you know that for future orators, he said that it is important that their mothers speak to them all the time and not simply the nurses. Why? Because future, because babies' language is formed by the people who are around them. And if they are around people who speak well and who articulate, they will imitate those verbal patterns and they will do so from the cradle. If they are around people who are not articulate, articulate, they will not form the verbal patterns that you want of your future orator. For example, one time when I was living back here, I was invited, I was a bachelor at this time, and I was invited over to the Fosters have dinner. And the foster children were homeschooled at that time, and I think his oldest daughter was probably about eight or nine. And I was invited by her to sit down at the dinner table and to have a seat. And I was told how lucky I was to be sitting in that seat. And she told me, you are so fortunate because each morning we buy for that chair. <laughs> now you're in a room of intelligent people. When's the last time you used the word buy? <laughs> it was at that point that I decided I need to marry an intelligent woman rather than the mere bombshells that Dr. Schramm had been trying to fix me up. <laughs> and I did so. The third component of good schooling, and I, I'll end right here and then we can talk, is the student. Or more precisely, how the student conducts himself and how he brings his own hard work and curiosity to learn. How original, you must be thinking. Education consists of smart, of smart and knowledgeable teachers talking to willing and able students about important books and problems. But as we've seen, these are precisely the elements that are being overlooked in modern education. A student is only as good as he is challenged to be. Therefore, learning must be rigorous. That does not mean there can't be jokes or humor. The human condition is at times a profoundly funny thing, but it does mean that the aim of learning cannot be fun, the word we hear so often. In fact, you know the derivation of the word fun. You know where it comes from? It comes from the Middle English word fun, which is another word for fool. And if you know anything about the Middle Ages, the fool, the court jester, 
person who takes nothing seriously. So the person who is always just trying to have fun, but is not aiming at something higher, is like a fool. And if you don't believe that, go through and read, I hope for the second or third time, Pride and Prejudice. And notice that Lydia, the, the, the wayward sister, that her favorite word to use is fun. Elizabeth Bennett almost never used it. I think never used it. At any rate, the thing that this sort of education should aim at is not fun, but happiness which is a higher end to human existence. So how do you get this? Happiness is in the pursuit of. Well, first of all, you have to teach kids how to work. And they should work. They should have homework in the elementary school. They should have two to three hours homework every night in the high school. And it should be serious stuff. Uh, it, it's no purpose if it's just Mickey Mouse things. But if it's serious, they will do it. And they will do it well. And it will create in them a work ethic. They should be required to speak correctly. Bad grammar should not be allowed. I can't tell you how many times students have come up to me and said, me and Jenny need to go to the bathroom. Can we have a pass? Me and Jenny must. Please, let's learn our cadence, folks. <laughs> More than that, they should also be required to dress better and to conduct themselves and comport themselves as you would decent human beings. Have you ever read this letter from Machiavelli where he says that you know he goes out all day long and he gambles and all the rest of it, but before, when he gets home at night, he takes off his old dirty clothes and puts on his, his robes, his fine robes, uh, and, and adorns himself such that, such that his whole court can be amazed. There's something to be said for not just lying around in these, sorry fellas, but these really stupid looking basketball pants with the, with the lanyard hanging out of the pocket. And in fact, putting on some decent clothes and having conversation with the great books. It'll, it'll also improve your dating life. <laughs> but, ladies, I should also say this. It also doesn't make sense to sit there and read Tolstoy wearing these, these awful um, warm-up pants with the word pink written across the bottom. <laughs> Can you imagine Dolly Madison or Abigail Adams sitting there and, and you know, corresponding with John Adams or James Madison and husbands with, with warm-ups that say pink on the bottom? It's too It doesn't work, does it? Um, more important, two more things that I'll say that are important for a, for a good career. We talked about blowing out the moral lights around us. What we ought to be doing is reigniting these moral lights. And the best way to reignite those moral lights is, I'll just ask you the question, see if you know. If you were to go to a college in the 18th century, let's say when James Madison was going to college, he went to Princeton when it was still good. What was the capstone course you would take from the college president? Do you know what the capstone course is? Any idea? Moral philosophy. Moral philosophy. And moral philosophy was divided into two branches. Politics, or government on the one hand, and ethics on the other. And the idea is, and it's an old Aristotelian idea, is you cannot understand politics unless you understand human nature. And you can't have first principles unless you understand the good. And the thing that young people do not understand these days more than anything else, the, the major questions that they have on their minds are about the good. Ethics is the discipline that used to teach people to do this. <coughs> duties to yourself, duties to other people, whether private or public, and duties to God. And young people need to relearn these duties. What are the duties you have to your wife? What are the duties you have to the, your children, to the citizens in your community? What is a man? What is a woman? These are things we don't know anymore. What obligations do you have to your children, especially if you're a woman, once you have them? What do you do? You're responsible for a human life. That needs to get talked about. And it needs to get talked about early, in school and in college. And so one of the things that I did in the school is require moral philosophy for graduation. And I taught the course. As if to say, this is an important course that the principal's putting his time into. And with a course like that, you can change people's lives in a good way, because you're teaching them about the good. The other thing that I would say is that if the school is going to be good, it has to have some rigor. And the best way to have rigor is to do exactly what you're doing here, that, which is what Dr. Schramm referred to, have a senior thesis. Uh, the school out in Colorado requires every student to write a 25-page senior essay that has some, something to do with the nature of man. That's all that you say. It has to have something and it has to be based on the great books and the great texts and the great political scientific issues that they've read in school. They have to 
write that paper, and then they have to get up and defend it in front of students, in front of faculty, in front of their parents. And it's a rite of passage. And I guarantee you, once they've done that, they know they've accomplished something. And they know that anything they'll do, do later on in their life, they can actually handle it, because they've handled this big thing called the CPTs. And it's interesting how many of these folks actually end up talking about how these books have influenced their lives. It becomes very personal. At any rate, I need to stop there because I know you all have questions and I want to have a discussion. And I'm open to talk about anything. Thank you. If you could uh, identify students for us. Okay, and certainly. And go on. Students with questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, something that you mentioned um, is that like, you want to set doesn't solve the problem because they can pass the test and still slack off, right? right? So how about this as a solution? No attendance. And any teacher can be fired for not doing his job. I'm going to use this school called Reach. By the way, Cyrus is a sophomore triathlon. Uh, former student of mine. Pretty good guy. I uh, haven't seen him in a while. But at any rate, a school called Ridgeview back in Colorado. And there are a few schools that are a lot like um, you know, one of the fundamental principles is, and if you set those schools up, there will be no teachers union. And every one of the contracts, to include the principals, will be at will. Uh, it's a scary thing, the contract says you can be fired for any reason or no reason at all. <coughs> but you sign this thing and you know that you can be terminated, with or without cause. There's no union rep that's going to come in to save you or anything like that. And it means that, no, you don't teach, you know, you don't do a fairly good job for 10 or 15 years and then slack off the next <coughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. This kind of goes along with the last question. How do you judge if a, if a teacher is doing well and our education is not doing well? Visit the classrooms. <coughs> and here, let me tell you what happens, I think, in a normal, regular public school. You have these arranged visits where the teacher knows that the, the principal or whoever the curriculum dean is going to come by knows weeks in advance. Sometimes, when I was in school, I don't know if this is still the case, but we'll tell his class, oh, the principal's going to be coming around tomorrow, something like that. Yeah. And so what you have is what we call in the military a dog and pony show. You come in and see, you see this student's, this teacher's best class on his best day that he's prepared for for a long time. And who is the person who's actually judging the student? Is this person bright? Does he know anything about the subject? Is he himself well-versed in the subject? The answer to that is usually and they're usually looking for the wrong things. You know, they have a checklist of things. Um, uh, is he using the whiteboard in the right way? Um, uh, does he follow the, uh, oh, what do they call it, the, uh, the outline, the lesson plan? All this sort of, all these gimmicky stuff. That's not, that doesn't tell you whether any teaching or learning is going on. The only way that it can work is a bright principal, a bright headmaster, going into the class, whatever he feels like. Whenever he happens to drop by, watching the class, seeing where the students are engaged, seeing whether the teacher can teach, then that lets you know. That's the only way to do it. Now, obviously, younger teachers are going to be more nervous. They're not going to be as good as older teachers. And so the person who's in charge of this has to have an eye for good teachers. But ultimately, it comes back to the school leader, which is the element that we didn't actually talk about, being able to judge what education is. So that's my, that's my thought on it. Yes, yes ma'am. Homeschooling is really easy. Marry a smart wife. <laughs> no, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to be a smart woman. I mean, sorry, I don't mean to be so gendered. I don't mean to construct genders here. Um, here's, a let, here's a dose of reality. Um, you're going to get married someday. You're going to have a fine, upstanding husband. He's 
99 chances out of 100, he's not going to do the cooking, the cleaning, or the homeschooling. Um, those are going to fall to you. I mean, there may be one case where the father's out there doing homeschooling, but that usually doesn't happen. And it's usually the maternal instinct that kicks in and makes it that way. I, who do have a PhD in history, tried to teach something historical to my son the other day. You don't think I've been doing a good job? You know, my wife said, I can teach him history. She got a little defensive there because I was stepping in and she thought, goodness, maybe uh, maybe I'm encroaching on her territory. But she, she backed off. I can, I can actually teach my son something occasionally okay, by the time he gets to high school. I, can teach myself. I don't mean to be flip, but you need to find a good curriculum and you need to be smart and you need to work through reading and use all the right progress programs as you would. Is that what you're asking? Oh, you? What is, who is you? The state? No, how do you ensure that the students are actually achieving that? I don't mean you, the state. I mean, as community members, as people who are depending on the future generations, how do those groups of people ensure that the students are actually getting what they need? Okay, well, it's a crapshoot. Uh, <laughs> because there are some people out there who claim, who claim, who claim to be doing homeschooling or not. Um, but I think the whatever enforcement that you have in mind, set up in order to make sure that homeschooling is actually good would be such an infringement on personal liberty that you really can't risk it. See what I mean? I don't, I don't want somebody from the state being able to come in and check in on every, uh, every homeschool. Now, there are certain things you have to do. You have to register with the state and those sorts of things, and that's fine. But I don't think the, the you there scares me. I don't, I don't want sort of some sort of state agent to come in and check in every homeschool. Now, the fact of the matter is, most people who take it upon themselves to homeschool um, are doing it precisely because they fear they fear the public schools. And to take on that kind of burden, usually it's not uh, it's just the lame and the lazy who are doing that. These are usually very ambitious mothers. A lot of them uh, have had successful careers and decide, I trust, I trust myself with my children's education more than I trust you know, whatever else is out there. Does that answer your question? Yes. I hope so. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being with us today. But my okay. question is sort of goes along with educational standards. Right. Um, right now, the federal government has developed and developed the you know, Common Core standards mm -hmm. that states are slowly starting to adopt, including Ohio. Right. Who do you feel should be in control of standards? Should it be the federal government or the state, or do you propose an alternative route? Uh, okay, no, not the feds. There is this problem with the Constitution, which no one seems to read anymore. <laughs> um, uh, there's a really interesting story behind federal government coming more and more and more into federal education. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that it works, the scenario is um, there's some crisis out there. And the only way we can solve the crisis is if the feds step in and give it more money and what have you. The original intrusion of the federal government into public education, do you know when that, <coughs> what actually brought that on? It was the first time that the federal government really had a major The argument was made, we're being outclassed by the Soviets. You know, they're launching uh, things out into outer space. And if we don't step in and improve math and science and so on, um, we're, we're going to be a second-rate nation. <coughs> Interestingly enough, there were a lot of people who resisted that. To include, there was this one famous statement made by, um, let's see, what, what state was it? Um, one of these science and technical institutes in, uh, I can't remember the state, but it's kind of an MIT, but on a state level. And this fellow was before Congress, and he said, I do not want to come become like the Soviet Union in order to try to, try to beat the Soviet Union um, at, at their own game. And he said, you know, now it's, the, now it's the professor in the tweed jacket who comes before you, but if we set this precedent, there's always going to be some excuse for the feds to get more and more involved. So I'm, I'm totally against the feds. Uh, in fact, I'm, I think the states made some pretty dumb regulations. Um, uh, I don't know if you've read this essay or not around Good, good friend of Dr. Schramm and some of these other folks whose name is, I don't know how to pronounce it right, Dakota Vila. Dakota Vila wrote an essay called the, the Ruling Class this past summer. And he pointed out an interesting statistic, which, which was that if you go back into the 1920s and 30s, there were um, infinitely more school districts than there are now. Why were there more school districts? Well, because there was more freedom. There was actually more school choice. And the chances of a community member actually serving on a public school district were very high. And so, um, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, but I think the idea that charter schools provide with a new measure of choice 
gives you more options of citizens actually getting involved in education and being able to do things that are not just simply regulated by the state. Uh, for example, the state regulation that you have to have certified teachers is ridiculous. All it does is protect a monopoly. And that's done by the state. Um, so um, I, I think the more deregulation, the better. Uh, and I think local citizens, in, in a Tocquevillian sort of way, are really the ones who should be controlling, controlling the schools. And I, I've looked through these, these federal guidelines, as you said, and they're either semi-helpful um, or not helpful at all. Uh, but the main thing that I fear is that, um, for example, when you look at the works of literature, they say you need to read a rigorous work of literature, such as, and then they give you two or three examples. They don't say which lit literature you have to read. But if you understand the mentality of how these schools actually work, what ends up happening is, you know, you read that, and you read the such as, and it says, so it'll say something like, you need to read a rigorous work of literature in the 10th grade, such as the Federalist Papers, or Maya Angelou's Why the Cur Cage Bird Sings, or something like that. And they have these lists of two or three. A lot of the stuff has new books and political press stuff. And so you think, well, what's going to happen with these school districts? How are they going to interpret that? And by the way, are these things ever going to be updated? Because if this had, if they get it in with they have when they have some works like the Federalist Papers and Tom Sawyer and things like that in it, what happens when they update it? The next administration that comes around, then the books change, and the feds are in total control. They get to determine the change. So I'm I'm very skeptical of national standards. Yes, ma'am. You talked about like how to pick good teachers to run the school, but I um, come from a small town in Pennsylvania, and our the problem with our school district is the administration. So how do you think you pick good administration, like principals, should they be former teachers? So that, like you said, so they know what's going on, or? You've just uh, landed upon maybe the greatest crisis the nation actually has in reforming education. Uh, it's actually, it's not easy, but it's also not hard to find good teachers. Um, the, uh, there are a whole number of students every year who graduate from there are students here from the Ashbrook Center who went through Georgia. You can find those folks. Finding somebody who can actually run a school is hard. Now, anytime you mention administration in the district, that's that's a no, that's a, a non-starter because these people are protecting a particular interest. But let's say you were starting a charter school and you're you're a parent, you're a community member, you're looking for a good education. <coughs> I don't know where to find that person uh, because there are not too many around. Now. This, I'm glad you brought this up, this is where the crisis is. <coughs> because we need people who can run schools. Presumably, yes, they would be former teachers or former professors or former military people. Uh, because former military people know how to run organizations. There are a couple of very good schools in Colorado uh, who, who uh, ended up in Colorado Springs being in the military, and they were hired, and they were on their second careers to run a school. Why? They know an organization. They know how it works. They know what a mission is. They know they have to follow it. They know how to take orders, more or less. Now, if you do put that thing into place, and this, by the way, is what I call the George Washington. Um, George Washington was not himself a philosopher. Well, you, you could say he was, but he was very sensitive about his lack of education. And therefore, he had to rely on other people who were philosophers, people like Madison, Hamilton, and so forth. The thing, the thing Washington had, military man, uh, but more or less he was just a good citizen. And he had an almost perfect prudence in making decisions. Prudence, of course, you know, is the virtue that is the uh, perfected ability of making right decisions. So if you could put somebody into that place, let's say a former military person who had a kind of academic advisor, uh, who didn't have the, the capacity to run a school because people would regard him as you know, too much of a geek or whatever, if he knew how to make decisions, line with the mission and he could listen to his teachers and whatnot, that would be a perfect principle. So to answer your question, you want somebody who's like a philosopher king, or you want somebody who is at least has these king-like qualities and who has perfect prudence and who therefore can run an organization and make decisions based on good information. Yes? You talked about also the teachers union. Do you think that getting rid of uh, the unions for teachers in some districts would help with the administration trying to like get things done in the school? No, because the administration is corrupt. 
Remember the first rule of school reform. Don't expect reform from within the district. It has to be an outside school. Don't expect it to happen, ever. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons I can tell you. But l let me say one more thing. Uh, and Dr. Schramm and I were just talking about this before we, we started this. Um, there is going to be a growing need of good <coughs> school leaders in this country because the states are progressively being able to, to they're progressively relaxing uh, the laws and the people are demanding that and so there's the possibility to, to have good schools. But these schools aren't going to be that good. They may just be a little different unless we have good school leaders. And that's why you sort of folks were interested in, I don't know how you phrase it, but making a difference, being a citizen, or what have you. You need to think about that. There are a lot of folks, you know, and I know people in the Ashbrook Center sometimes think, I want to get into politics. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do that. And, you, and the typical idea of doing that is going off and working, being some cog in the wheel in a think tank in Washington, D.C., and working on education policy. If you work on education policy, what you will do is you will help write some sort of survey that says, schools in America don't work. And you will be about the thousandth, thousandth person to do that. And no one will notice your report. If you actually get into a position where you can run a school, <coughs> you will have a profound effect on your community. And you will be a local community member. And, um, and reform of the schools in particular is going to come in the states. It's not going to come from Washington. So if you have any kind of ambition like that, who knows? It could lead to politics. I would think really hard about getting into a school and setting yourself up in a way that one day you could reach and lead this school. Because that's important. Um, yes, ma'am, way back there. You said that it was important to teach Could moral stand, please? Yeah, Thank sorry. You. you said it was important to teach moral philosophy and ethics in school, and I'm wondering if that's more responsibility of the parents and shouldn't that have already been taught before you get to that stage? Um, well, okay, let me let me let me state that clearly. First of all, there used to be this idea in this country, this was an 18th, 19th century idea, that the three major institutions all worked together. And those three major institutions were home, church, and school. The three major educational institutions, I should say. And the laws were actually a fourth. The laws are supposed to educate you. Um, doesn't mean you need a lot of laws, but they, they educate you in self-government. No. It's deliberate. I have too many anecdotes that know that, <coughs> know that that is the case. So if you go back to an idea that the school is actually supposed to support the home, then you're not going to say, well, what your parents taught you about sex or whatever else is wrong. You don't do that. Uh, in fact, what you do is try to work with the home in these things. But you're also teaching a curriculum. And if you look at the books that you will end up teaching in this curriculum, they're almost all moral in some way. It's not necessarily an overt moral lesson that says, follow this or do this. But, for example, Pinocchio. Have you ever read the original Pinocchio? I am convinced that the original Pinocchio is uh, essentially Dante for children. <laughs> Every time Pinocchio does something wrong, he gets a punishment for it. And the punishment exactly suits the crime. You can't teach Pinocchio successfully without having a discussion about character. You can't do it. If you do, you're not being faithful. If you, if you think you can, then you're not actually being faithful to the text. And so over the years, you will have these rich discussions about character uh, just by reading the books. And so by the time you get to moral philosophy at the high school level, all you're doing is now showing them the principles that they've been imbibing throughout your curriculum because that's what the classics say. Um, Pride and Prejudice, which is probably my favorite novel, uh, is one of the greatest lessons in Eros, and I could possibly imagine. Uh, and, and, you know, young folks who worry about Eros and that sort of thing, they have to think through these categories. You know, the, the challenges Elizabeth faces and all the rest of it, if you, if you do that successfully, you're going to have a discussion about morality. You're going to have a discussion about uh, men and women. And it doesn't have to be preachy and overly prescriptive. It just happens because that's what the books are about. I could go into some details about how I, how I teach moral philosophy, but that, that's the main thing to understand. Um, for, for, let me give you an example, just one example. One time we were having, we, we were getting some sort of award uh, by the Department of Education, believe it or not, we were getting some sort of blue cheese award. And so 
we had some representatives of the U.S. Department of Education come out to the school and visit. So, you know, usually what happens when you have big wigs do one of these, you know, visits is you have the band come out and you have the choir come out. And you put on a big show and you don't really talk about anything serious. And not that the band's not good, but that's just what these people expect. So what I decided to do is let's showcase somehow our education. And so what I did is I went to each one of the grades, K through 12. Well, not the kindergarten because they're too squirrely. But I went <laughs> each one of the grades and I found a student nominated by one of the teachers say, who would you like to represent your class? And I, all I did is I told the student, I said, I want you to talk about a book that you've read in class and tell, you what, tell us what you thought about it in two to three minutes. And so what happened is they came in, we had, we had this kind of assembly. And these kids, starting with the first grade, got up there and talked about something. And would say, talk about a book and say how it affected them. And um, uh, Every one of those, and this was not prescribed by me, almost every one of those students went to the moral theme of the book. Whether it was Dostoevsky or whether it was, I forgot what this second grader said, but it was something about, um, uh, well, it was, it was kind of a, a, a kitty version of the, uh, the uh, Iliad. And she, she said, we learned all about um, Penelope, and, or not Penelope, but Paris, uh, and um, help me out here, um, Helen. And we learn not to take another man's wife. <laughs> Brilliant. Second grader came up with that. So you see, you see what I'm saying there? You're not undermining the parents. And parents, this is the education they want. I would say that more than 50% of homeschoolers are not sending their kids to school precisely because of the moral element more than the, than the intellectual element. We have time for a couple more. Is this yeah. all right? Okay. You don't mind? Sure. This is great. Uh, yes, ma'am. You back there? Um, when you said that you'd rather have someone with a PhD or a master's to present the work than the master's education courses, what do you do with that person that has a PhD that doesn't know how to convey the information? Because I know in high school we've all had those teachers who are very intellectual but don't know how to say it. We've also had those professors. Okay. I want to say two things about that. It's a great question. First is, realize that by asking that question, you are getting caught up a little bit in a stereotype. And it is a stereotype that is perpetuated by the public school system. Because they want you to think that anybody who can fog a mirror intellectually is so out of touch with kids and reality that you know they're, they're going to put on their tweed suit the wrong way, and they're going to go to the wrong classroom, and they have these absent-minded professor qualities. Is this really true? Are all really smart people that incapable of living a human life? Um, I mean, I've known Dr. Sakinga for a while. It seems like he gets more <laughs> <laughs> He's not, not hopeless uh, when it comes to driving a car. So this is stupid, this idea. Now, it is true, and I've met people who do fit that stereotype, but that's easy, that's easy to solve. Well, two things about that. Number one is, when you're hiring a teacher, what you should actually do is not just go to one of these big hiring conferences and look at somebody's portfolio and decide they're on the spot, oh yeah, we want to hire this person. What you do is you have this person come out to the school and teach. And you watch this person. And then you ask a lot of really hard questions. And after the person's taught, you actually then have the students talk to you. What did you think about this? Uh, so there is a way to figure out whether someone is an absent-minded egghead or not easily enough. The second thing I'll say is this. It is true that there are people who are highly educated or intellectual who have idiosyncrasies and eccentricities. But if you have a choice between somebody who's just not very bright and doesn't have those eccentricities, or a person who's really bright and has those eccentricities, isn't it true that you've had teachers or you've known people whose very idiosyncrasies were amusing? And you could learn more from them than you could just from a kind of Oh, kids, let's have fun. You know, let's do this project. You see what I mean? So if you're going to err, err on the right side. Yes, sir. Uh, can you speak for just a moment um, about this, uh, how to practically start this revolution from the outside? Because it seems like starting a charter school is kind of a big thing. Right. Uh, how does one go about doing something like that? Well, okay, there are different things. <coughs> from a career point of view, um, if you're interested in teaching, you should know that there are places out there that are, that are
starting to hire teachers, and there are more and more around the place. And right now, this initiative that we have going on in Hillsdale, we're starting to talk to folks, talk, talk, we're starting to talk to folks in, in Ohio about this. In fact, it's very likely that there's going to be two schools starting in Columbus, or in the environs of Columbus, within the next three or four years. So a lot of this is already going on. Okay. But what I would say is, um, even if you don't go into education yourself, you're a citizen. Whether you want to or not, you're always going to be paying taxes. And on top of that, 99 chances out of 100, you're going to have kids. And so when your kids get to the age where they need an education, all I would ask you is to be smart about their education. And you may decide, you and your wife may decide, that in order to get the education that we want our children to have, we have to become citizens in this community. And we have to start or help start this. And the, the charter school revolution is being started primarily by parents who are not themselves uh, educators, they're not necessarily former professors or even professional folks, you know, they're not necessarily lawyers. They are people who just are dissatisfied with the current education. And they're doing things, and mainly what they need is some people to help them do it. And you could be one of those people. If you've gone through the Ashworth program and you've read these great books, you are you are so much farther ahead of everybody else in knowing what a liberal education has to look like. You see what I mean? I mean, if you want the details, you, you have to go to your state um, website and look at how you get a charter school started or something like that. But at the moment, you're a young man, and most 22-year-olds don't start by doing that. But you'll be in a position someday where, where you can. And as far as the legislature is concerned, those of you who have political aspirations, I think it's very important to make sure your legislators understand what true school reform is. Because my experience with legislators is they're nice people, but they don't necessarily understand education, and they'll vote wherever the pressure goes. And most of the pressure is generated by teachers unions. And they have all the re reasons to think you know, charter schools are bad. For example, we just lifted the state, I say we, I don't live in Michigan, but the state of Michigan just lifted the charter school cap. There was a cap on how many charter schools and a couple of le state legislators called us and said, well, is this cap good or bad? Because everything I hear about it is it's good because we can't have too many of these schools because it waters down the quality. And so we had to talk through this issue with this fellow. And this fellow was just somebody who owned a funeral par parlor. I mean, he didn't know anything about education. So if you do get involved in politics, particularly at the state level, keeping the pressure on well-meaning state legislators is very important. Um, you talked about this model for good schools. You talked about good teachers, a good curriculum, and good students. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know why your model doesn't include family, especially since you've talked so much about our future husbands and wives and deciding that for our children and your own family. <coughs> why doesn't that model include a good family? No, it, it, it does include family. That, that's a good question. But remember I said there are three principal things, uh, and there are two others that we could talk about. The two others that we could talk about are leadership and the family. Um, so this is this is pretty pretty critical, um, and having good and supportive families are something that you have to build in the school community. Um, now, that's also problematic uh, because I've I've run a school, and running a school is one of the most political positions you can imagine. Uh, because all you need is really one mommy upset about what her child made in a, in a certain class, and she has a lot of friends, or she likes to gossip at her church, which is often the case, you can have a whole bunch of mommies who then hate you, and you haven't done anything. Um, so you, ha you have to know how to, you, you have to make good decisions that try not to inflame the families, but at the same time you know that you're going you're gonna to always be encountering families all the time. A lot of them, a lot of them are going to be really, um, really mad at you. So there, there's, there's a lot of negotiation but on the whole, you're, you're absolutely right. The idea of bringing families back into education is critical. And once again, from the perspective of running a school, it's essential because here's the thing that I've noticed uh, when it comes to hiring teachers. It's the hardest thing in the world to hire elementary teachers because especially primary elementary teachers, younger grades, because what you usually end up hiring are young ladies fresh out of college who are very nice, who have this tendency to get married and have babies and want to stay home or move. So you have to keep replacing 
to replace it and replace it. Every year you've got to replace this. I made the mistake, awful mistake, it's not a mistake, but I made the mistake of hiring two um, women uh, to teach sixth grade, both of who had graduated from Thomas Aquinas College, one year after the other. Now, if you know what Thomas Aquinas College is, it's a Catholic great school. These women get married right out of college and they have a baby as soon as they can, and pretty soon here you are replacing this great book for 18 months. What I found is the mothers who bring their children to the school are very often, they had careers, then they decided to stay home with their kids, they want a second career, they're looking at doing something, in their words, meaningful, and very often that means coming into teaching. And they make so that's it. That pretty soon, you're, many of the kids who are going to be in the school and many of your teachers are going to have their own kids in the school. The school itself becomes a kind of family. It has a family feel to it. In the same way that I'm sure you've had Ashbrook scholars whose older siblings have come here. Pretty soon you know the parents very well. This happens at Hillsdale all the time. Uh, we, have, um, we have families who have um, you know, seven and eight and nine and ten siblings. Uh, and, and they all just keep coming through the school. Pretty soon it's a family the family. Well, this happens even more in a school environment because it's local. So that, that's a great thing. I, I don't want to diminish the importance of families, but it's, it's tricky because, boy, I tell you, those mommies can get upset when, they, when their children don't get what they consider a fair shake. I can give you examples of that. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I'm going to go off track here, but I think I'm actually going to answer your question. Um, there, there are two things about the family and the community that you have to understand. Um, a lot of very well-meaning parents send their kids off to mediocre or worse schools, and I say worse, because they're absolutely convinced that, oh yeah, the public schools are bad, but we live in this great suburb where everything works around us, and therefore the schools here are really good. And that's what I call the suburban myth. And I'm, in a way, on a personal mission to try to inform people And what's unfortunate about that is your, your typical suburban parent, these are people who get involved in the school. A lot of times they come in volunteer and all that stuff. And they're convinced that their kids are just going to be in place. Um, that, that's a hard problem. Uh, and and um, there's, there's a separate education kind of education that has to go on with that kind of parent. The, the parents that you're talking about, and I'm not talking about your family, but just in general, are more, I would say, your, your kind of inner city environments uh, where the Parents just look at the school as a kind of daycare. Uh, they're not particularly interested in education and all the rest of it. And that's that's very disheartening. We're working with a school down in Savannah right now where we know that the lack of parent involvement is going to be a problem. Um, and I don't know how to solve that problem other than I will tell you this, those communities understand better than anybody else that their kids are not getting a fair deal. And in that environment, but I think in any environment, you want to use the school in a way not just to educate the students, but also to educate the parents. And I, I don't mean that in a condescending way. Um, I think all parents out there have a kind of, there's a kind of unease in the country right now about a lot of things. Schooling is one of them, but a lot of other things, politics is one. And the parents who themselves went through these schools and who themselves live in this culture, they, they know something's not quite right, but they don't know what it is. And so the school, through the education that it, that it gives its, its, the children, will end up teaching the parents about a lot. And the way that you know a school is actually working is when you have parent after parent come up to you and say, you know, this is the education I wish I would have had. If you have that starting to go on, then you have a successful school. Now, um, 
I don't think you can go out and force parents to care. Uh, but if you do something this way where you're setting up a good school that people are looking at, then people are going to start talking about it. And when they start talking about it, in a way, it's going to be unavoidable because it's in front of them. It's in the newspapers, and the neighbors are talking about it. And I don't think any parent wants to be thought of as not a good parent when it comes to their children's <coughs> education. Uh, in fact, they want to, they in some sense, prove that they are good. And so if you can, if you can create a school in your community that generates this kind of conversation, more and more parents will start talking about it, more and more parents will start caring. And they, they will understand that they just can't be indifferent. And what's at stake here, and this is why I started out with the link, and it's actually important, is um, public education reform is one aspect of a reconstitution of self-government in the country. Moral self-government, political self-government, educational self-government. And what you're doing is you're, you're actually showing an example of an institution that can work um, with just a little, with just the right principles and, and some gung-ho and a lot of work can be generated from a local community. And once once that sort of thing, once it once it becomes the an example, kind of city on a hill within a community, it sets an example, and part of that example is going to be the parents. Um, and let, let me give you an example. Maybe this doesn't describe what you're saying, but maybe I'll end with this. One of the things that I hate to do more than anything else in the world, I think, is go and get a haircut. Um, my wife goes and loves getting a haircut. She spends about an hour. She comes home. She tells me all about the personal life of her beautician. And I'm sure that her beautician knows all about our personal life. Kind of life. When I go to a haircut, I, I realize every time how little freedom I have because the, the, the lady who's cutting the hair thinks that she has me captive and she wants to know everything about my personal life. And I hate that because I don't want to tell her anything. At any rate, I used to go in these hair places when I was back in Colorado, and, and, and I would just, she would say, well, what do you do for a living? You know, how are things going, and that sort of thing. And I would try not to tell her much. Um, and, but they would always pry. And so I would say, okay, I run a school down the street. Okay, which school? And I would tell her which school. She would say, wow, like, really? I said, you've heard of it. You know, it's just this little charter school. Yeah, I've heard of it. And then she would say things, that, you know, there were several of this times, when those kids come in here to get their hair cut, they're well-dressed, they behave, they're not jumping around uh, from place to place, and sometimes they're reading books. Those are great kids. And then sometimes I would get the, I would, I would get the statement, I'm trying to get my kids into that. So when you do something like that, you can, I don't think you can underestimate the profound influence you're having on your entire community. And people will notice, even people you think are not going to not going to notice, we'll notice.